Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being with us. It's Gramercy Books Author Night, featuring two culinary entrepreneurs and authors in a conversation about a soulful and gorgeous cookbook called The Chef's Garden. International produce guru, Farmer Lee Jones, will be in conversation with American ice cream maker, Jenny Britton Bauer, about Farmer Lee's book and his cutting edge regenerative agriculture techniques. The Chef's Garden was recently released by Penguin Random House. I'm Linda Cass. We're live streaming this program through Zoom webinar, and it will be recorded. Let me preview the next hour or so for you. After introductions, Farmer Lee and Jenny will talk for about 35 to 40 minutes. That will be followed by 15 minutes for your questions submitted in the Q&A box. You'll find that icon for the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen if you're using a desk or laptop. This is where Jenny will be taking your questions for Farmer Lee during the latter portion of this program. You can write your questions into this box at any time during the program, and I encourage you to do so. Those questions, liked by many others, will be upvoted, which means they'll rise to the top of the Q&A box, most likely to be asked. Another tool is the chat box. This allows you to chat among yourselves, but it will not be monitored by the panelists. That icon also is on the bottom of your desk or laptop screen. I, we hope um, you, your chats don't distract you from what will be an intriguing conversation tonight. I do want to draw your attention for a moment, though, to the chat box. So if you will click onto that icon now, it will open a column on the right of your screen. We've placed registration links for three upcoming author programs hosted by Gramercy Books. First, on Tuesday, that's next Tuesday, June 22nd, at 6 p.m., Eastern time, and that's a different time than we usually have our program, 6 p.m. We will feature prize-winning biographer Ann Seba's latest book, Ethel Rosenberg, An American Tragedy, whose espionage-related crimes defined the Cold War and horrified the world. Ann will be in conversation with noted Ohio State historian and author David Steigerwald. On Wednesday, June 30th at 7 p.m., we'll have our first hybrid program, and that means in store and on Zoom, as we feature two local writers in conversation about crime fiction and specifically the latest mystery from writer Andrew Welsh Huggins called An Empty Grave. Andrew will be interviewed by fellow Buckeye Crime Writers member Connie Berry. And finally, on Tuesday, July 13th at 7 p.m., our Gramercy Book Club features award-winning author Joshua Henkin's latest novel, Morningside Heights, which was the number one June uh, book pick by booksellers across the country. It's a tender, powerful, and big-hearted novel about love in the face of loss. Former Dispatch Arts Editor Nancy Gilson will interview Josh following the group discussion, which she will facilitate. We encourage you to click on the link for any of these programs to learn more about them, as well as to register if you'd like. You can sign up on our website, GramercyBooksBexley.com, and receive our e-newsletter. It'll tell you a lot about all of Gramercy Books' exciting live-streamed and hopefully live programs. And now, on to tonight's program. Farmer Lee Jones and his family have been farming and cooking for generations. Ever since the early days of the Chef Garden's creation over 35 years ago, Farmer Lee has remained tirelessly committed to ensuring that the family's 300-acre farm near Hudson, Ohio, remains one of the most innovative and pioneering in the world. And he has also fostered a nuanced conversation with chefs throughout the country whose desire is to grow vegetables that are as aesthetically pleasing on the plate as they are flavorful to the palate. As a result, Farmer Lee is the go-to source for quality produce by restaurants across the country. Farmer Lee Jones works alongside Brother Bob Jr. on their family farm in Ohio, and both are inspired daily by what they've learned from their father, Bob Sr., who is affectionately known as Mr. Bob. They are committed to reviving heirloom vegetables and discovering exciting new varieties, all while telling their stories and farming sustainably so their vegetables are dense with flavor and nutrition. In 2011, Farmer Lee was honored with the James Beard Foundation's award for Who's Who in Food and Beverage, and he's spoken across the country as an expert in regenerative agriculture. 
Whether he's roaming a farm or at a black tie event, Farmer Lee is always seen in his iconic outfit, a white shirt with denim overalls and a red bow tie, a symbol of his commitment to regenerative agricultural practices. Farmer Lee, it is a thrill to welcome you tonight and for Gramercy Books to share your extraordinary cookbook with our Central Ohio community. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm very excited to be able to talk about it. And in conversation with Farmer Lee is Jenny Britton Bauer. Jenny is the founder of Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams. Jenny opened her first shop in a farmer's market in 2002 and has since grown the company to more than 50 scoop shots nationwide. She won the James Beard Award in 2012 for her cookbook, Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams at Home, a New York Times bestseller. She's been recognized by Fast Company as one of the most creative people in business. Jenny is a 2017 Henry Crown Fellow. In 2020, she served on the Small Business Council for the Biden-Harris presidential campaign. As founder and chief creative officer, Jenny remains active in the company and oversees all creative output. Jenny, welcome to Gramercy Books, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi, thank you. It's so great to be with you. It's so great to be with all of you, with everyone tonight, and, uh, and with you, Lee, too. <laughs> I see you've got your ice cream. Well, I, I wore my... You. I tried to match you a little bit today, so we look good together. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna leave the screen now for both of you, and I'd like to welcome and begin the conversation, Farmer Lee Jones in conversation with Jenny Britton Bauer. Thank you, Linda. I, I can't believe I don't have any carrots. <laughs> this is this uh, raspberry rose jelly donut. I just, <laughs> I just finished the last bit, it is amazing. Oh, thanks. I love that. Thank you so much. I heard that, um, well, this one isn't blackberries, but but in another flavor that we have, we have our, our blackberry growers here in Ohio. And they told me that the snakes love blackberries. Is that true? Have you heard that? That when yes, you're absolutely. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> and you know what? The snakes are good. They okay, the there you are. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have any poisonous snakes in Ohio. Snakes are a good well, thing on the farm. Okay. Well, then there you yeah. go. I won't yeah. be scared. I won't be scared. Well, it's so great to be with everybody. I am so happy to um, to be able to celebrate your book. I've had it for a couple months. You sent me a copy of it. That's why I don't have my cover on it anymore because I've been using it. I think this book is game changing. I think it's really an important book, Farmer Lee. I think that it's beautiful beyond measure. Um, it's not an ego project. It is a gift that you clearly gave everything to. Um, it is so beautiful. It's creative in a way that like speaks to people. Like when I, I'm going to flip through some of these recipes in a, in a little bit and they just hit you like, aha, like amazing ideas. Um, and I've cooked a bunch of recipes and they're all they're so beautiful and they all work as we know, not every uh, cookbook is like that. So um, when did you start working on this book? Well, I've been saying 40 years ago, uh, it's a lifetime's work collected in. And we're so lucky that we had Kristen Donnelly and Chef Jamie Simpson collaborating with us. Chef Jamie Simpson, of course, is responsible for all the recipes in here. Kristen did an amazing job. And of course, we both know Kristen and uh, Michelle DeMuth Bibb. And we had so many that helped really two and a half years to put it together, but it's a lifetime. And it was it was time for us to be able to share uh, some of our findings. It, was, it shares some of our trials and tribulations and failures, and hopefully a few of our successes as well. Yeah, I've been to the farm many times over many years. Uh, I mean, more than a decade ago, I think maybe my, was my first um, visit. And each time I go, I always love to take the tour. I love to hear the story. And in the beginning of the book, you tell the story in such detail of your family farm. I hadn't even heard all of the, the details, but maybe maybe you could just give kind of an overview um, of that story because it's a, it's a beautiful family story, Ohio farming family story. And it's also a really innovative 
business story? I mean, pivoting and, and all of that. Yeah, and as a boy, the last year has certainly been a story of pivots as well. But, uh, it's an amazing microclimate. We're actually 2.9 miles inland from Lake Erie. And Lake Erie is the shallowest of all the Great Lakes. And you might not think that really is a big deal, but it is a huge deal as far as affecting the climate here. The soil we're on is actually all old lake bottom about 11,000 years ago. Some of the richest sandy loam in the world. And in 1930, this area peaked with over 330 vegetable growers. It was huge in grapes and wine grapes even before Napa Valley. And uh, it's just been a, a, an area that has really had a lot of great vegetable production over the years. And my father went to work for a very progressive vegetable grower in the 50s and ended up buying the farm from him. And uh, my dad had some successful years in there. We were selling to chain grocery stores, like maybe some of the listeners remember the old Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, A&P, Kroger, in the Columbus area, Big Bear, Pick and Pay, Fisher Fazio were all my dad's customers. And it was high volume, low margin, selling really every place east of the Mississippi River. Um, maybe some of the listeners remember Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture for the United States. His message in the 70s and early 80s to farmers was to get big or get out. And eventually that caught up with us. Interest rates hit 22%. We had a very devastating hailstorm and it wiped out all of the crops. And consequently, we couldn't repay the loans to the banks. And at 19 years old, I stood with my mom and dad, my brother and sister, all of our neighbors, all of our competitors, everybody that was there to celebrate our failure. And they auctioned every single thing off right down to my mother's car and our house. And we started over. This is not a rags to riches story by any stretch. The rich part about it is we were able to stay together as a family and work together with a unified vision. And I guess we just weren't smart enough to know that we couldn't do it because we started over and have really carved out a niche as a small family farm to be able to grow the most nutritious, healthiest, best flavored vegetables that we could. And we really started by working directly uh, back with chefs. And we've been working with chefs for the last 40 years. Uh, I had never heard the squash blossom story uh, until I read it. Um, that that was a big moment for you guys. I mean, you know, moments, these moments, if they don't hit what, you know, can you imagine, um, you know, what would have happened? But, but, but tell that story. <laughs> well, immediately after we lost the farm, we started back at farmer's markets, which were ironically at a historic low. Today, they're at a historic all-time high. But in the early 80s, my mother's generation really didn't want anything to do with farmer's markets. My grandmother's generation was all about farmer's markets, but it was all about convenience during my mother's era. And we started back at the farmer's market, and we were so fortunate that we met a European influence chef. Her name was Iris Balin, and she had trained in France, and she was looking for product grown without chemical, grown for the flavor, grown for the integrity of the product rather than the tons per acre. And as a little farm, really with no farm, trying to start back over, it really resonated with us because it wasn't about volume. It was about flavor per mouthful. And so we grabbed around both of her ankles and we said, teach us. This is a direction we've got to go. It was a little glimmer of light that maybe, just maybe there was a chance for a small family farm to be able to survive in a world of corporate agriculture. And she was so spot on and she taught us a lot and turned us on to growing for the flavor rather than the tons per acre. And she said, you know, I'm looking for a zucchini with a bloom. And, you know, we had grown zucchini traditionally for years. And they're this long, this big around, 20 pounds in a carton. My dad had shipped them all over the country. We were expert zucchini growers. And so we thought until she said, I want one like this, three inches long, the size of your pinky finger with a blossom on it. And I came home and we talked to the family and we thought she was crazy. Well, she knew a whole lot more about it than we did. And our education began on really looking at plants. And that's been a theme throughout the book, but throughout the entire 40 years is looking at a plant and recognizing that at every single stage of a plant's life, it offers something unique to the plate. 
for thousands of years, we considered only the top of a carrot. We didn't even eat the part that we eat today. This is actually a good example. Here are the carrot blooms and they're amazing. And so for thousands of years, this was all we ate. But at every single stage of a plant's life, it offers something unique to the plate. So looking at things in ways that we're kind of preconditioned against, we, we make an assumption that if they're all supposed to be exactly the way we see them in a grocery store, but we can reduce the waste. We can do so much to reduce the waste if we consider the entire plant when we're eating it and when we're growing it. And your book does such a good job of using all the parts of the plant. One of my, I, um, one of the recipes that I did <laughs> was the squash, one of the squash blossom recipes. You sent me some of your squash blossoms and they cut in all different sizes. And it was cornbread stuffed squash blossoms. And uh, as soon as I read that, I was like, okay, light bulbs, I have to make this. It just sounded so beautiful and so perfect. And, um, and I did, and, and, you know, it was like involved like piping, you know, I, it, like in a plastic bag and then piping it in. It looked a little complicated. It wasn't, you know, I had little chives and I tied them uh, and I made them all and they were absolutely beautiful. Um, but the funny thing is I was alone in my house. There was nobody else here. <laughs> so I also ate every single one of them. They were beautiful, uh, but those squash blossoms are beautiful. And it is interesting to look at things a different way. Um, uh, with all of that. I, I just love it. I had a question about um, the soil that you talked about uh, in um, the sort of large scale corporate agriculture that was moving in. What has that done to the soil that was so perfect and beautiful th throughout Ohio um, now? Well, and really throughout the country, it's depleted it. Uh, and this is not a knock against other farmers. The farmers um, in, in corporate commercial production are following the model that exists. And that is to keep the cost as low as possible and to produce as many tons per acre as possible. And they do it well, and they do it efficiently. As it relates to our income in America, we produce food cheaper than any other country in the world. The conundrum is this, we also have the highest health care. Google this, listeners, please Google this. This is important to everybody from 1930 to the year 2020, the nutritional levels in vegetables have gone down by over 50% from 1930 to 2020, and they're continuing to go down at an increasing rate. Now, consider that factor, also consider the fact that we have a 3000% increase in kidney, liver, heart, cancer disease, attention deficit disorder, autism, childhood obesity, and allergies from 1930 to 2020, a 3,000% increase. Those are facts. That's not just a farmer sitting out on his tractor, rambling numbers. This is fact. It's not sustainable. You know, as devastating as it was to lose the farm and start over, it gave us a chance to rethink, what are we doing? You know, it was all about propping the plants up with chemical and synthetic inputs. We could produce higher yields, more tons per acre, but the integrity of the plant continued to go down. My dad had a saying that the only thing we're trying to do is get as good as the farmers were 100 years ago. And in many cases, that's true. But we're trying to tie technology to that today that wasn't available then. In fact, I'm sitting in our laboratory that's about three years old and we're testing. We believe fundamentally everything starts with the health and the balance of the soil. And we're really trying to find out what the par is, what the levels are. We jokingly talk about going out and harvesting some vitamin D from the sunshine. There's so much more truth to that than we even can imagine. So what we're doing, it's an unprecedented commitment to rebuilding soil naturally rather than chemically. So we're planting two thirds of 300 acres in any one year to things like clover, alfalfa, buckwheat, sedan grass. We have a 15 species planting that we're planting. And if you can visualize those plants harvesting the energy from the sun, they come down through the roots into the soil. And then when we plant these vegetables the next year, it picks that all back up and it builds our immune system to fight against those diseases. I kind of look at it like we're trying to farm like the Eastern culture. If you think about the Eastern culture, it's get the body in balance, to defend against the disease in the first place. The Western culture is you get sick, we're gonna give you an amoxicillin, a penicillin, a viacillin. We're always treating the symptom rather than being able to get a healthy plant. It starts with healthy soil, 
healthy vegetables, healthy people, healthy environment. And that's really the crux of what we're trying to do. I 100% believe that, that we're in, uh, in multiple, all the ways it feels like in America, we try to treat symptoms instead of working downstream to, um, you know, to, to, to fix what's broken and what's causing those symptoms. And we've become used to that, that we can use our bodies like it's Kleenex, um, our minds, we can do, um, you know, that, that the doctors will fix it. And uh, instead of getting into it and working downstream, but that's true of, um, of, of industry and agriculture and business and, you know, so many other things too. So, uh, and, you know, soil, I mean, um, so I have been, um, you know, on the tour many times, as I said, and I love that it's so much fun, you know, to get in the back of the, um, the, the tractor and like be on the farm and see the labs and the, um, you know, all of the, the things that you guys are doing. But I was curious because one of the things that, that always strikes me whenever I'm there is you have this constant curiosity of moving forward, getting better. You know, it's just constant. And I think that's so important. This is an exact um, opposite to what we were just talking about. You know, this idea of sort of just treating the symptoms. I mean, you're thinking sort of very holistically about everything and how, and always asking questions about how to get forward. So over the last, you know, um, well, many years, but even decade or two since I've been going to the farm, I'd love to know some of the things that you're tweaking forward or even things that you're excited about now. Um, or, and also anything that specifically that you want to, you want to chat about, um, in terms of, um, I know you were doing like, uh, the sort of fertilizer, the way you were doing fertilizer was so interesting. Um, but any, any of that? Yeah. Well, absolutely. And it's really a continuation of what we're talking about with rebuilding these soils. We believe our future is destined for health and wellness. We're seeing results as high as 300 to 500 percent higher than the USDA average. We, we are a country that is continuing to get less healthy. And we've got to reverse that as a society. It's not sustainable, the direction we're on. And we believe that everything that we've done to this point has built us towards really working towards health and wellness. We think that that's our future. That's why this lab was so important that we built out three years ago. We're excited about that. One of the pivot moves, 100% of our revenue was directly tied to restaurants up until March of 2020. And we were very fortunate that we were able to have a team that worked literally round the clock and made an, uh, an online delivery service, made it available so folks could be able to get healthy, safe vegetables at home. Uh, we were afraid to go to grocery stores. We didn't know where the food was coming from. I think people are more concerned, more interested, more curious than ever before about where their food is coming from. Mm -hmm. And so making that available to individuals nationwide, literally in a 24 hour period, um, it, number one, it helped save the farm, literally, but we felt like it was the thing that we could do to be able to help people through a pretty horrific time. And we're, we're recognizing that this was probably a miss and not being open to the public before now, but sometimes I guess we're just a little thick headed and it, uh, it took something pretty major for us to recognize this. And through this tragedy, we've uh, seen the light, if you will, and recognize this as an opportunity. We even opened a, a farm stand right here on the farm. We hadn't done that in 40 years. We had an old farm stand that we had, uh, retired to a, an equipment storage shed and it was on the back 40. And we dug it out of the mud and we drug it down the road behind a tractor and we power washed it and gave it a coat of paint and put a new roof on it and we opened to the public. And we gave folks uh, a place to be able to get something that was sell safe and healthy and direct. And you know, one of the questions we get is when the restaurants return, are you gonna close the market down? Absolutely not. So we're excited about being able to open up to the public to provide healthy, nutritious vegetables. I think that it's important for them, you know, folks are voting with their dollars right now. They're voting by spending dollars with things that are important to them. And they wanna know how the folks are being treated on the farm. They wanna know how the land is being taken care of, how the environment is being taken care of. And we're voting with our dollars for things that are important to us and important to the world. And so it's exciting to be moving this path with 
with the world as we move towards a, a plant-based, plant-forward future. I can't, like, isn't it crazy that you have to go through such struggle sometimes to find the most creative ideas? I always think that um, creativity is actually thinking inside the box. You know, we have parameters and then you get in and solve that. So when you're faced with a crisis as a company, it can be the best thing for you. It's never something you would wish on your worst, you know, enemy if, you know, whatever, who has enemy, but you, you would never wish it on anybody. And yet at the same time, you know, when you get through it, you, you, you're changed for the better. So that's so, that's so beautiful. I'm so happy to hear that. And we all get to continue getting our boxes of, of, um, of, of produce. I'm going to drive up for one of those, um, for one of those, uh, farmer's markets for sure. That's worth the drive to Milan for sure. And that's a fun drive too. I want to remind everybody to put uh, questions in the uh, in the Q and A. Uh, we're going to move to questions in a couple in ten or so minutes. So just get some questions loaded up, and let's pivot to talk about this book because um, I love it. I have um, cooked many of the recipes. Do you have a favorite, a favorite recipe, or? <laughs> You know, um, it's always a most frequently asked question. I'm sure it is for you. What's your favorite oh, yeah. ice cream? And I always say, what season is it? Look, mm -hmm. I think Mother Nature provides such a natural rhythm to what we should be putting on the menus. One of the greatest questions that I get from chefs is when they call and say, farmer, what should I put on the menu this week? I love it because yeah. there is such a natural rhythm. So today, maybe it would be Mr. Fry's rhubarb. Um, Mr. Fry and Mrs. Fry were two of the best farmers in Erie County. As I mentioned, there were over 330 vegetable growers here. And Mr. and Mrs. Fry actually brought with them when their ancestors came over from Europe, a rhubarb stock. And we grew rhubarb too, but the variety wasn't nearly as good as Mr. Fry's. And whenever he had any extra, we would always buy it from him. And we gave great reverence to them and to the rhubarb and would buy any, and he had regular customers because it was before chain grocery stores. So him and his wife would harvest their, their rhubarb and their lettuces and their onions and radishes in the morning. They would go in and eat lunch and their social hour was making the deliveries because all of those family owned grocery stores became their friends over 50 years. We gave such reverence and praise for them and the rhubarb that when they died, they willed us their rhubarb stock. And as an ode to Mr. and Mrs. Fry, we have rhubarb menus on all over the country with chefs. And so we, act, we could not think of doing this book without doing a rhubarb recipe. And so to Mr. and Mrs. Fry looking down on us tonight, Aww. we give you great tribute and great honor for all that you did by bringing this rhubarb to America. Thank you. Oh, that's so wonderful. And rhubarb is always one of my absolute favorites. One of the things I just love to do with rhubarb, and it's so simple, is just put a little sugar on it, put it in a so like slice it really thin, not really thin, but like quarter inch, and just put it on a stovetop in a little pan with a little bit of sugar. It it sort of softens very quickly and then eat that with salty caramel ice cream. It's so good. It's so beautiful and so simple. Um, but it's, yeah, wonderful. I'll tell you the recipe that I'm going to make next. And that is because it's actually the first one I have um, um, bookmarked. It's the trust roasted celery stalks with celery root puree. I am a huge celery fan, but I love the like creativity here of trusting it. Um, and celery is so beautiful. I love being on the farm and just pulling the leaves and just eating the leaves is they're, they're, they're almost, they almost are like a Sichuan pepper corn where they almost give you that sort of uh, numbness or like a vibration a little bit on your tongue. It's kind of interesting, but I make ice cream out of the celery leaves. Um, wow. It's, they're so full of scent. So I love that one. We made also the, um, the tomato soup, even though it's not quite tomato season, we were craving it and it was extraordinary. So I'm very excited for my tomatoes, which are growing outside. Oh, well, yeah, we, we actually had your tomatoes. You sent us some. So that's why it was so delicious. My You're mom made it. close. <laughs> so, so beautiful. Um, and then the trout with sorrel sauce. That's the one that I'm going to make next to. This one looks beautiful. I love sorrel so much. That's another one that you can make into a, like a frozen yogurt or something like that, which is um, so beautiful. It's like tart. Um, and gorgeous. Any other recipes that stand out for you that you like are super excited about or that have stories? They all have stories. 
Oh, beet marshmallows. I mean, every one of them is so wonderful. Sorry. The other one that I love with the beets is the uh, thumbprint cookies. Oh, yeah. These are yeah, actually, you guys, beets with like pomegranate syrup, I think. Oh, yeah. Right. Pomegranate glaze. Isn't that so sweet? Uh, they're so they're cute. delicious. They're delicious. You know, um, there are so many. And I think that every recipe really has some sort of a purpose or a meaning beyond just a recipe. Um, if you think about Brussels sprouts, for example, the Brussels sprouts take nine to 10 months to grow. It's this majestic, beautiful plant that's three and a half to four feet tall. And the beautiful leaves that come down to provide a canopy to keep the Brussels sprout from sunburning. All this energy, all the love, all the nutrients that are going into this Brussels sprout plant. And we just picked the Brussels sprout off. You know, in Europe, folks over hundreds of years of survival have learned to use every part of an animal, the gelatin um, between the hooves, the, the tail of the ox, the tongue, every part of that animal is celebrated and not wasted. In some cases, just because of desperation, they learn to use everything. I can think of no better way to be able to celebrate the plant's life than to use the entire thing. I would defy your listeners to be able to, if they were blindfolded, to tell the difference in a collard green and a Brussels sprout leaf. Can you imagine taking the Brussels sprout stalk and peeling the tough outer skin off and making a, a vegetable marrow with the inner insides of the Brussels sprout? It's just such a beautiful way to be able to celebrate that and use all of the energy. What a great way to be able to reduce waste. Look, unless you've lived under a rock the last two or three years, you know we have a 40% food waste situation in America. Quite frankly, I believe it's understated. And I think that there's no greater way than to be able to be in tune with the seasons, know when those seasons are ebbing and flowing, have a relationship with your farmer's market, with the farmer, with the producers of whatever it is and know when those seasons are and to really be able to take advantage of them. So my favorite recipes always evolve around what season is it and how can we celebrate that particular season? How can we put, how can we put the asparagus on a pedestal and celebrate it? Because it's in season for four weeks and we should eat it three times a day when it's in season. And when it's out of season, we should lust for it for 10 more months. Yeah, you know, I love it um, in our kitchens. Um, just when we would just get sick of actually taking the tops off the strawberries, you know what I mean? Then we'd move on to blueberries. It would be so excited. And then we'd move on to whatever. And then suddenly it's pumpkins and it's sweet potatoes, you know, and it's like, it's not just the work of taking off the top, it's the scent, it's the everything. So you look forward to it and you get into it and just about when you've had enough of the task, it shifts. And so I, I totally um, I feel that and, and agree with that in terms of how we should be cooking and, and exploring flavor, um, you know, these pleasures from the earth, I think. Um, and I love, I love how you guys take advantage of those seasons and do such a beautiful job, even in ice cream. And I just, I love that. There's so many symbiotic synergies, relationships between what you do and what we do here on the farm. Um, but it's, uh, I think it, it's really what every chef is, is, is aspiring to do all over America. Yeah, and it really is. I mean, you guys were so early on this and identified that moment when you could latch on to an idea spark that was going to, um, to, to, to save your family farm and, 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 and become what it is now today. But, you know, you've got 11 Madison Park now switching, you know, only doing vegetables on the menu, which is so exciting. Um, uh, Ferran Adria, he says, oh, the future of cuisine is vegetables. Um, you know, this is definitely, uh, with these guys on this, we're going to see a much, I mean, we've seen it for years. It's been building, but I think it's going to go so much faster now because we see these heroic sort of figures in the, in the culinary world shifting completely over, um, to vegetables. I, I am so excited about this move. I think it's, it's, it's bold and it's brilliant for them to move to a plant-based, plant-forward menu. Uh, I think that the ripple effect of this will be profound. Mm -hmm. Am I suggesting that every restaurant in America is gonna all of a sudden go vegetarian? No, 
I think that there, there's going to be a ripple effect. People are going to be more cognizant. Chefs are going to be more cognizant of putting uh, plant-based, plant-forward recipes or menus out and offering. It's not going to be, oh, well, you can have this and we'll take the chicken off of the salad. It's going to be thoughtful, uh, creative dishes that will be veg-centric and plant-based. It's very, it's the future. It's inevitable for sustainability of society. We have to move this direction. Yeah, and when you get creativity around these vegetables, as you as we see in your book, I mean, this is one example here. The baby corn dogs, it's actually baby corn in there. <laughs> um, so sweet, so adorable. But when you get that creativity around what vegetables can be and the extraordinary um, bounty that we have all year, I mean, just variety of every single vegetable, once we start to really open up that creativity and the deliciousness, which we have only scratched the surface, um, color and just inspiration and flavor and scent will, will, will drive, I think, cuisine in a way that it's really just been salt and fat before, you know, which that's still important, but, you know, um, you know, with meat or proteins or whatever, you know, so I think that you're going to, we're just going to really see this like beauty, beauty, um, bounty on the, on the plate. Once we get everybody really thinking creative, creatively ab about vegetables, which are really easy to think creatively about because so much color. I mean, one of my favorite things to make ice cream out of is beets. And you pull them out of the ground and they look like a shrunken head and they're like, you know, just, so, and then you cut them open and they, the ice cream and you know, you, your fingers get pink. Um, and the ice cream is neon pink. You know, it doesn't take much um, to make it neon pink, but the, the colors are just amazing. And then, then, you know, that even can trick your eyes to what you're tasting a little bit and, and it all plays together. So I think that this is going to be really a, a, a moment. And I think your book is really uh, hitting at the exact right time. I just love it so very, very much. I think it's so beautiful. And I've read the entire thing, like cover to cover, and it's like, um, just amazing. So anybody that doesn't have it yet, I just, um, I just think you'll, you'll love it. And, um, it'll be one that you reach for often on your shelf. It's, um, absolutely gorgeous. So congratulations on making this amazing book. Let's ask, um, let's get some, some, uh, let's, let's, let's go to some of the, some of the questions that are coming in and anybody who has any questions, feel free to, um, to throw them in, in here. Let me see. I have, um, oh, a business tip. Uh, for a young farmer who is trying to sustain their family's farm. Our, this is a quote, our farm has been around since 1830. Uh, we are working on educating customers on why we use organic methods. Um, oh, and true farming question, how do you keep squash beetles from your zucchini, melons, et cetera? <laughs> Well, both of them are difficult questions. <laughs> uh, let's start with the beetles. Our pretense is, is that when you get things in balance, um, you have a better chance of defending against insects. There used to be a show on TV back when I was a kid. And for farm kids, it was kind of exciting. On Sunday night, it was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Oh, yes. And it, and it took us to places on television that, were just mind boggling to us on the farm because sitting around watching TV was kind of a luxury, but we got to do a little bit of, if our homework was done Sunday night, we could watch that. And we would see um, a herd of gazelle and a cougar or a lion or a tiger attack that herd. And which one did they go after? They went after the weak one or the old one. Healthy soil, healthy vegetables, healthy people, healthy environment. And they really all work together. And the, the healthier and more in balance that we can get the soil and the healthier the plant is, the, the insects don't wanna to go to it. Insects attack the weak plant. And so the best offense is good defense or the best defense is good offense in getting the soil healthy and having healthy plants go into it. It can actually be so sweet tasting that the insect doesn't like it. The other things that you can do in the way of that plant are to be able to do things that are offensive flavored to you or offensive flavor to the insect. So you can come up with things like garlics and hot peppers and different things that are, are an offensive flavor to you are gonna be offensive to that insect. They're, they're not easy. Uh, the business, uh, you know, I think that one of the big misconceptions that we have or 
issues that we have as small family businesses is we underrate the value of what we're providing. Um, somebody might say, well, I can get a bundle of asparagus for $1.99 a bunch at Walmart. And maybe you're charging four fifty. Maybe you're charging six dollars for yours. There's a difference in the way it's grown. You know, uh, I believe it was Hippocrates that said that let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. There's a value. How much do you charge for uh, pharmaceuticals? For if you're on a prescription, it can be hundreds of dollars. Don't underestimate what you're providing. Help educate people on the value that they are getting and provide real value and a difference. Differentiate the product, but don't be afraid to defend it. Everybody knows what their product is worth, and they should price it accordingly. And if it's $1.99 at the store, maybe there's a reason it's $1.99, and maybe there's a reason yours is $6. Um, defend, defend your quality. Always defend your quality. And Jenny is in a better position to answer this than I am. We're still trying to figure it out here, scratching out in the dirt. So maybe you can answer that better than I can, Jenny. I don't think I could answer it any better than that. I think you absolutely have to defend your quality. And, you know, for us, that meant growing slowly over the last 26 years, but that's important. It's important to be able to, to you know, charge, to, to, be able, to be able to make something beautiful or grow something beautiful um, is, is worth it. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta defend it. I agree. Mm -hmm. no, no. Uh, so someone wants to know if you are growing most of your plants from seed and the follow-up to that is what's happening with heirloom plants and their seeds? A question I don't understand, but maybe you will. We are, we are growing most of our plants from seeds. Uh, we bring seeds in from probably 15 different countries to find them. Uh, we are working with, of course, the heirloom is grown because the, the flavor hasn't been bred out of it. Most of the varieties you're seeing in the grocery store are bred to be able to ship 3,000 miles and to produce a lot of tons per acre, where the heirlooms are still in their unadulterated form. We're just starting to pick them. This evergreen tomato has cracks and cat faces, much like you might remember or your grandparents would have remembered growing. They're a variety that hasn't been bred for perfect shape and the ability to ship. This tomato in my hand is soft. It's ready to eat. It would cut so beautifully. You would have to have a hanky in one hand as you bit into this and the juice would be dribbling down your chin. And you get these tomatoes in the store and there's just nothing there uh, because it's varietal. But, but what we're doing is working with some guys that are crossing. There's a difference between uh, DNA and genetic selection. Genetic selection is if you're saving your own seeds and you've got 100 plants, you go through and you hand pick the tomatoes that have the characteristics that you wanna reproduce. And then you cross those. That's not DNA, that's just genetic selection. And we're using uh, some guys, small scale guys that are actually crossing some of the characteristics of hybrids with old heirlooms. So we can get some characteristics so that um, they will ship and uh, they'll hold up and they have some disease resistance. So that's one of the things that we're doing to be able to try and have the, the the heirloom variety flavors, but to be able to have some of that disease resistance. That's amazing. Um, okay, so Joy would like to know if, um, if, if we can only buy your produce at the market on your property. I mean, I think your website too. Um, and, then, and then actually, what is the date? I mean, what are, what are you, when can people come up and, and buy from that market? Well, uh, you can go to Farmer Jones Farm Dot com and you can gift uh, boxes to anybody across the nation. You can get a subscription for yourself. Uh, we During this pandemic, we had a lot of people that were doing okay financially and they were secure, but they wanted to help. And sometimes people were calling and buying five different boxes and shipping them to somebody that they knew needed some help, uh, or they were getting one box at home and shipping some to somebody else. So farmerjonesfarm.com and you, we curate different boxes. Chef Jamie Simpson, who put all of the recipes together along with Chef Tristan in here, uh, puts, together, puts together boxes. We basically walk through the garden um, and look at what looks great for that particular day and put boxes together and you can add on different things. So going to the site at, at any time and you can order. And if you're in Ohio in the summer, 
and in Naples in the winter, you can ship, ship it and we'll uh, change the address and ship it to you down south. So uh, the farm market is right now just open on Saturdays from eight until three uh, until our season gets in. We've been short staffed. So uh, until we get all of our spring planting done and get things caught up on the farm, we're open Saturday from eight to three here on uh, the corner of Huron Avery and Shide Road in Huron, Ohio, H-U-R-O-N, Ohio, 44839. Uh, and we would love to see you. Our Jamie and Tristan are there a lot of days. We talk culinary. We talk, it's really, it's just a buzz. It's fun. And we talk about how to prepare and a customer may come and say how they prepared something last week and how they're grilling it. The grill is so underrated with vegetables. Grill the asparagus, grill the green beans, grill the squash, grill the tomatoes, have fun and just play. And we hope that the book just inspires, whether you're a gardener, whether you're a home cook, whether you're a chef, uh, whether you're a farm market connoisseur, it's really about inspiration. This isn't, we assume that people know how to cook. This isn't teaching you how to cook. It's to inspire you to look at vegetables in different ways than you've ever considered before and play and have fun. You achieved that big time. I mean, absolutely. And I do think that the techniques, I think they're elevated, but they're 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 very doable at home. Uh, I had I've not had any problems with any of the rest. I mean, you know, they're not complicated. They're so simple, but they're so inspiring. That's the thing, and obviously, so very very flavorful. Um, I have the smoky tomato soup uh, open here right now, which we made. Uh, my mother made it. it was wonderful, and the tomato sandwiches to go with it. Um, speaking of those, I mean, just and vegetables, like my favorite thing to eat probably on the planet, like a desert island food is a slice of tomato on buttered, like melted butter toast with a little sea salt. I mean, it's, it's so good. So tomatoes, I can't wait. So I'm going to come up and see you at, at the market, um, as soon as possible. <laughs> we'll drive up. Um, somebody's wondering about veggie U. remember veggie U? is it, are you still uh, doing veggie U? are we? Um, we are not. Veggie U is no longer. Okay. And then, uh, and then, you know, uh, any more festivals on the horizon, vegetable festivals, what's going on? Um, what's next for, for, uh, yeah. Chef's garden. Yeah. You know, um, the culinary vegetable Institute has pretty much been dark for a year and the chefs have really kind of refocused on building out things. I say that 2020 was the year of lemonade. Uh, we had lots of excess of, of sweet potatoes. And so we made sweet potato dog treats. We had lots of edible flowers that were excess and uh, we were deadheading them and Chef Jamie and Tristan turned it into tea. Uh, the uh, Culinary Vegetable Institute that normally has about 600 visiting chefs a year was turned into an Airbnb. I mean, we were swinging for base hits. Mm -hmm. This is a small farm. We don't have any festivals on the horizon. The COVID has kind of... Uh, had us make a spin and we're doing, we actually have a private event tonight with 45 chefs from assisted living, um, assisted to living facility. We had uh, an anniversary party for uh, some folks that were having their 50th anniversary. All of the events have been private where everybody knows each other and there's been still a concern, um, reasonably so for safety. So we're trying to take that cautiously and, and we'll work through that as the season progresses. And I hope that we'll have some public uh, events on on the uh, on the roster going into September later in the season. Yeah, and I just think one of the things that I love about uh, bringing people to Ohio to celebrate you and the farm is that it's just a proud moment for Ohioans. I mean, I know it's so much work for you guys, but it is. You know, I think everybody that that got to to go to that just felt so much pride for for you know, what the farm represents, which is this extremely high quality attention to detail and, and then a high level of creativity and innovation um, right here you know, in Ohio. So it's, it's wonderful. And the fact that you exist and this book is out there is something that um, we're all very proud of as well, of course. Well, this is an interesting kind. question. What's that? Yeah, that's kind of you. Uh, but you know, we've always felt like when, the, when people came to support these events, we were doing something special together. We mm -hmm. can't do any of these things. I mean, in all the times that you came up to help us and you've been so generous with your time over the years to be able to help us with common causes to do better. And when the people come, you know, we just feel lucky that they come. 
And so we're, we're stronger together, working together on unified visions of trying to do good. And mm-hmm. so we're so grateful for all the people that have come over the years. And, and, and you've uh, so always expressed that. I mean, that's just yeah, such, a, yeah. such a trait that you guys always have that gratitude, always, always giving. And I do think that when you give, that sort of is a gift that you give to the world this quality, this love that we, that we do. And it, and it's just becomes this cycle. I, I agree with that. That's wonderful. This is such an interesting question. She's, uh, or, or I don't know if it's a she or he or, or um, I'm looking at my zucchini stems and wondering about using them in place of rigatoni, uncooked, tossed with hot pasta sauce. Zucchini stems. Well, I'm going to say, first of all, I'm a farmer, not a chef. Uh, Chef Jamie would be far better prepared uh, to answer that than I would. But the answer is yes, you absolutely can do that. Um, I thought it was going to go a different direction. I don't think we have the male and the female, but of course the uh, the female is the squash. The, it's the flower with the squash. And uh, you can use the male or the female in that dish, but absolutely you can. I think that's a brilliant idea. Let us know how that comes out. Barbara Jones. <laughs> Uh, Farmer Lee Jones on Instagram and send us a picture and let us know how it turned out. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, the the follow up for them also was, uh, do you have tours for home cooks or only professional chefs? So maybe go up to, uh, to Huron to, um, uh, to ask in person too. But yes, that would be, do, are you doing tours for people yet? Or, or? We will have those on the schedule uh, at the farm market. We'll be offering those for folks to be able to go out into the fields and we'll talk about what we're doing. Um, We visualize it certainly as a a small revenue stream, but we'll do that as part of the farm market. Absolutely. And those will be on the on the uh, website for the farm, Farmer Jones Farm Market. Well, I love the um, the um, you your the statement that you guys always say, which is growing slow and gently in full accord accordance with nature which is so beautiful. And I just looked at my notes and I was like, I wanted to bring, make sure that I said that because I just think it's, um, it's true. I think it's, a, it's when we live like that, then we can um, do business like that and farm like that. And you know, it becomes this whole, um, this whole sort of almost way of living and um, being in community and so on. One thing, maybe last question that I had for you and, you, and feel free to comment on that too, um, is the Grapes of Wrath story with your outfit. I, I mean, I've known you for 10 or 15 years and I've never seen you in another outfit. Um, I think once you said you went to maybe a funeral or something and you put on a jacket. <laughs> yeah. um, but I didn't know that story about the Grapes of Wrath and I thought that was beautiful. Well, I'll elaborate on that. It's one of the few books that I read in high school. Um, we always thought that those cliff notes were always cool. If we could do the cliff notes and get a B on the on the book report without reading. It was not a very bright move on my part, but the Grapes of Wrath book really drew me in, of course, by John Steinbeck. And it talks about the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl and the tragedy of many families losing their farms. And little did I know that just five years after I read that book, that we would really be on that same path. But if anybody is you know, up for an old Netflix, you can still get the Grapes of Wrath on uh, Netflix. It's an old black and white. Henry Fonda is like 22 years old as the main character in it. But it talks about families losing their farms, packing all of their belongings. In many cases, three generations on one truck with the family dog and maybe the cow tied on back, desperate for a place to start over and just look looking for a place to get work. And there were some large ranches that would take advantage of them and put them to work and maybe they would pay them a dollar and a half a day to work, but then they had to pay 50 cents to stay in the camp and another 50 cents for a meal. They would end up almost owing at the end of that. They were destitute, they were broke, their clothes were worn, their clothes were torn. But there's a scene on a Saturday night, as destitute, as broke as they were, the farmers put on their clean overalls, even though they had holes and they were worn and they were torn, they were clean and they had white shirts and their head bow ties. And despite all the hardships they had, they maintained their dignity, they maintained their pride, they held their heads high and they had a square dance. And it represents so much to me 
for everybody that's ever had a farm, everybody that's ever wanted a farm, anybody that's ever lost a farm, anybody that had had an aunt or a grandparent and they have fond memories of that farm. We're a small family farm and we wanna represent all of the goodness that's represented in small family farms all over America. I don't own another pair of pants. There's an old saying on the farm that you can't make a silk purse out of a cow's ear. Well, I could never dress up and go to New York and I have gone to many events in New York City with the guys in tuxedos and the women in beautiful evening gowns. I could never look as good as them. There's, I carry a pride, I'm not proud or boastful, but I carry a pride of going as a farmer and representing farms. I don't literally, I do not own another pair of pants. I have 18 pairs of overalls, 18 white shirts, 18 red bow ties, um, funerals, weddings, I, I just, every single day, this is what I wear. And I'm proud of it. I go to church on Sunday morning with this. I take my hat off, of course. I have on occasion put a jacket on. I married my son two years ago. He asked me to marry him and his wife. And I had overalls and a bow tie on. It's just, you know, it's just representing something that's important to me. Well, I think it's beautiful. And I've loved seeing you in New York in, in this, um, you know, it just, it does make, I, you're making that statement and I think it's wonderful. And I think people see, of course, people see that. And that's why everyone, everyone loves you so much. <laughs> um, well, it's wonderful to, to be able to spend this time with you, Farmer Lee. I just cherish it so much. And I thank you for, for writing this book. It, I, I do see it as, it really does feel like a gift that you and your team gave to the world. I really feel that. And I feel it from the book. I feel it from eating the recipes. And I, um, I definitely always feel it from you. So thank you for writing this. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Jenny, thank you for taking your time to be able to talk with me. Anytime I get to talk fresh veggies, uh, I'm a happy guy. Yes. You and, so you, know, eat, I, you know, it is that ice cream and vegetable. Vegetables are very important to me. <laughs> I can't do this job without, without lots of vegetables because I eat so much ice cream. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody else too, everybody for showing up and coming uh, tonight. This has been so much fun. And if you haven't gotten uh, your hands on the book yet, I hope you will very soon. So what do we now? There we go. I'm There's back. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much, Farmer Lee and Jenny. Um, it was the, it was a wonderful conversation, and um, this is an extraordinary book. And anyone who doesn't have it yet ought to have it. And you ought to tell your friends and family about this book. Um, we're going to have a, a link, another link in the chat box. Uh, you can click on there and, and uh, get to this book. But um, it is an inspiration. Um, I love the idea. The future of cuisine is vegetables. So, um, you know, we, we also have added a link to, to Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams at Home, and, and your book is, is superb as well, Jenny. So again, thank you so much for this conversation. The audience was extremely engaged. Lots of wonderful questions from them. Um, we really want to thank everyone for, for joining us this evening and um, let everyone know that we are open 10 to 6, selling both of uh, Farmer Lee and Jenny's books in our store and I invite you to come uh, visit us. And thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>